Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Wednesday, November 4th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. A steady supply of obscene literature had been finding its way into half a dozen high schools in the city. We'd gotten a lead on one of the sources of supply, a 17-year-old high school senior. We had to check it out. Hey, I can see for yourself. All right, you want to take everything out and lay it on the bench here? You can see what's in there, can't you? My gym stuff, a couple of textbooks. What's that back there in the corner, right-hand side? Where? You know where I mean, dig it out. Oh, back here you mean these joke books? That's right, let's have a look, huh? Why? Just a couple of joke books. A kid gave them to me. Bring them out, Steve. Okay. Just a couple of them. A kid gave them to me. Here. There's more than a couple there. That's what you call a joke book, Steve. Oh, well, that's what the kids call them. They're not so bad, though. They're rotten, Steve, and you know it. Now, where'd you get them? I told you. A kid gave them to me. Who? What's his name? Some kid around school. I don't remember right now. He gave you these books for nothing? Sure. I had a couple he wanted. We traded off. A lot of the kids have them. We trade them around. That stack you got there, they look pretty new. They couldn't have been passed around much. Maybe not. I don't know. Matter of fact, they look brand new to me. Don't even look like they've been opened yet. How come you're rousting me on this thing? What about the other kids? They got them, too. They're buying them, Steve. They're not selling them. I'm not selling them. Anybody says that's a liar. Now, both the fellows in the high school and the kids down the street in the junior high, they say you've been selling this stuff for months. Now, how about it? They're lying. That's all. They don't know what they're talking about. You've been selling these 35 cents a piece, three for a dollar. Last couple of weeks, you've been peddling pictures, two dollar a piece. Any of them in your locker, Steve? couple. I got him off another kid. What other kid? What's his name? Come on, what's his name? Some kid. I don't remember. That's not much of an answer, son. What do you want from me anyway? I told you I'm not selling the books. I don't care what those other goofs say. It's my word against theirs. Maybe you ought to get this much straight, son. We're not out to get you. You're way down the line. We want the people at the top, the men who print this junk, the wholesalers, the big distributors. So why ask me? I don't know anything about it. Nothing. You don't want to cooperate, is that it? What am I supposed to cooperate about? I'm not mixed up in anything. We think you are, son. We know you are. Now, who are you selling this for? Where do you get your supply? All you see is what's in my locker. I ain't selling. I don't have any supply. You've got to go far to prove I have. No, not very far, Steve. What? From about here to your home. 11.38 a.m. We picked up the supply of obscene books and photographs to be booked later as evidence. For weeks, we'd known that a steady stream of this type of material was being fed into half a dozen high schools and junior high schools throughout the city. Books, photographs, pictures and pamphlets of the worst kind. 12.15 p.m., Frank and I drove the suspect, Stephen Banner, to his home, approximately a mile from the high school. On the way, he told us he lived with his sister and brother-in-law. We checked the house thoroughly, but we found nothing. He explained that both his sister and brother-in-law were at work. We went back to check the garage at the rear of the house. All right, how about it, son? You want to show us where the rest of the stuff is now? It's a use. I guess you'll find it anyway. Right there. Books. Cases of them. Pictures. Filthy. How about it, son? Your sister and brother-in-law know anything about this? No, they don't know anything. All right, you ready to tell us about it? My sister gonna have to find out? I don't know, Steve. It's gonna be pretty hard to keep it from her. Yeah, I guess so. Who's the contact, son? Where'd they come from? Charlie. Charlie Hopkins. Only the books, though. Pictures came from another guy. It's a long story. We got the time, son. Who's this Hopkins? I met him downtown one Sunday. Penny Arcade on Broadway. Me and this other kid were in there. Bud Spencer. Hopkins came up, started to talk to us. All right, go ahead, son. He asked me and Bud if we wanted to sell for him around school. This friend of yours, Bud Spencer, is he sell them too? Yeah. He goes to a different school, though. Well, both of us did pretty good with the books. So real fast. The pictures were even better. That's so. Now, you say you didn't get the pictures from Hopkins. It was somebody else. A man by the name of Jack. I don't know his last name. Hopkins put us on to him, gave us an introduction, set up the deal. We got the pictures for 75 cents. Most of the time, they'd bring us a dollar, dollar and a half a piece. 
Bud and I did pretty good. You know any other fellows working for this Hopkins? Any other kids in school, I mean? No, just Bud and me. That's all I know. Wouldn't be so bad if it was just the books. That lousy Charlie had to go and promote the party routine, get everybody mixed up in that. How do you mean? What's that all about? Charlie stays out at this place on Sepulveda. It's a motel. That's where we always contacted him. Yeah. After a couple of weeks, when we got to know him, he asked me and Bud out to this place. He said he was going to throw a party. Told us to bring our girlfriends along. Turned out we were the only ones at the party. Me and Bud and the girls and Charlie Hopkins. Well, the party lasted pretty late. I should have been smart enough to figure it out. I wasn't. How old are your girlfriends, yours and Bud's? Seventeen. They're both seventeen. They've been around, though. There's no use kidding you. They weren't very smart, I can tell you that. None of us were, I guess. Next couple of parties, Charlie had whiskey there. Dumb girls drank right along with him. So did we. Does he still throw these Friday night parties, do you know? Maybe, I don't know. I heard there were a couple after the last one I walked out on. Dumb girls think Charlie's just great. That's all I can't stand the guy. Now, how about the parties that you didn't go to, Steve? Did you get a rundown on them? No. Never fails, does it? What do you mean? The oldest line in the world, and they still go for it. Yeah, what's that? Tell them you're going to get them in the movies. 1.20 p.m. Frank and I took the cases of obscene books and pictures from the garage, loaded them into the back seat of our car, and Stephen Banner directed us to the high school attended by his friend, Bud Spencer. We picked up the Spencer boy and drove him and Banner downtown to juvenile division, where we booked them in on 700B, Welfare and Institutions Code, Lack of Supervision. We drove to the address out on Sepulveda, but the suspect, Charles Hopkins, had moved out five days before. No forwarding address. It wasn't a dead end, though. From his registration card, we got the description and license number of his car. We checked out the address of his confederate, the man known as Jack. He'd moved the same day as Hopkins. No forwarding address. We called DMV and got a make on the license number. The car was registered in Hopkins' name, 293 North 92nd Street. Frank had gone over to r and and pulled the package on the suspect. 3.40 p.m. Last address on him is three years old. Well, how's his record read here? Well, he's been in business before. A couple of ag charges and a 502. Yeah, I see. Served eight months in the county jail. I got a mug shot here. Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. It's close enough to the way the boy described him, isn't it? I'd say so. His ammo, too. Yeah. Same pitch the last time they got him working the high school trade. Passed himself off as a studio man, movie producer. Yeah. How about the other man, Jack? We got anything there? Not yet. Did you give the information on him? The stats obviously going to make a run? They will. Okay, that's good. Well, I guess we better check on the kids' girlfriends, huh? And get their stories. Yeah, I suppose so. Sure gets me, Joe. What's that? A pair of young girls like that out at parties till 3 a.m. drinking. Yeah. 17-year-olds. No reason for it. No reason at all. I can think of one that might do. Yeah. Their parents. A check of the suspect's address furnished us by DMV and also the information from the R&I package led us nowhere. We had a second interview with Stephen Banner and his friend Bud Spencer. We showed them Hopkins' mugshot and both of them identified it. We got out a broadcast and an APB on him. 4.12 p.m. Together with policewoman Noreen Statesell, Frank and I drove out to interview the two teenage girls involved, a Dorothy Ryan and a Laura Osborne. We stopped at the home of the Osborne girl first, but she wasn't there, and neither were her parents. An older sister told us that both the mother and father were working, and that Laura was at a neighborhood school for models, taking her weekly lesson. When's the last time you saw Hopkins? About ten days. Two weeks ago. What's this all about, officer? You looking for Charlie? How does he usually contact you? By phone? Yeah, uh-huh. he usually calls. He called you lately? Well, I don't know. Why are you looking for him? Can't you tell me? Routine investigation, miss. Oh. Well, I'm sorry, I don't know where Charlie is. Why can't you tell me why you want him? We want him. Well, why? Can't you give me a reason? This is one of the reasons, Laura. Would you look at this picture? Charlie took this? That's his business. That's the way his police record reads. I can't believe it. He was nice. He didn't seem that kind. Now, that's one reason we want Hopkins. There's lots of others. You willing to help us now? He said they'd be beautiful, glamorous. They're not. You know where he stays now? No, I'll find out, though. How do you mean? I got a date with him. Supposed to meet him out on Wilshire. Wilshire and Liberia. When's that? Eight o'clock tomorrow night. Frank and I went across the street to the district attorney's office and presented our case. 
A warrant was issued on Charles Hopkins for 702 WIC, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. At 7.45 that night, Frank and I staked out on a cocktail lounge near the intersection of Wilshire and La Brea, the place where the suspect had told Laura Osborne to meet him. 8.15, 8.30. Joe, hmm? down at the corner heading this way. Yeah, it could be him. Yeah, dark glasses. Yeah, that's him. Come on. Just a minute, fella. How's that? Police officers. Your name Hopkins? No, that's not my name. Can we see your identification, please? Sure, I have my identification. Why? Can we see it, please? What do you want? Your identification. What for? I haven't done anything. All right, mister. We'll talk about it downtown. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want any trouble. I'll show you. There. See? My driver's license. Take it out of your wallet, will you, please? Certainly. Charles Hopkins. That's an old address, isn't it? Yeah. I've had time to change it. Just got back in town. What's the matter, anyway? Where are you staying, Hopkins? No place. I just got back in town. I told you that. Not staying any place. No connections at all. Where's your car? Don't have one. Haven't had one for a year. Sold it. Say, would you mind filling me in? What do you want with me, anyway? All right, Hopkins. Let's go over here out of the way for a minute. Okay. Just want to know what's going on, that's all. I'd like to see what you got in your pockets. Take everything out. What is it? A shakedown? You start with your wallet. All right. Put down the seat. There, okay. Now your pockets. There, okay. You don't have a car, is that right, Hopkins? No, of course not. I told you that. And what are you doing with this parking ticket? Eight fifty-five p.m. Frank and I finally located Hopkins' car in a parking lot two blocks away from the point where we apprehended him. In the glove compartment of the car, besides a half a dozen photographs and small books, we found a key with a metal disc attached. Stamped on the disc were the words "West Side Studios, Number Twenty Three." Hopkins refused to identify it. He refused to admit a thing. He was booked into the county jail on the contributing warrant. The next afternoon at 5.30 p.m., we drove out to the old West Side Studios just off Jefferson Boulevard. On the way, we tried to again question the suspect, but we got nowhere. One look at the old West Side Studios, and you knew right away it had seen better days. The place had been fairly prominent back in the early days of silent pictures, but all that was left now was three square miles of broken down scenery. The faded sign over the main gate read West Side Studios, founded 1920, admission by pass only. Hopkins unlocked the gate and we drove onto the lot. The place was deserted. The sun had almost gone down. It was a cold wind from the north. Hopkins directed us to pull up and park. We can go on foot from here. Come on, this way. You run an office here? Is that it, Hopkins? No, sir, I do not. I live here. You in some kind of movie work? Have been for 30 years. More than 30 years. Is that so? You an actor? Hopkins. Haven't you ever heard the name? I'm a producer. Oh, I see. Why didn't you tell us that to start with? Oh, I don't know. Different reasons. I didn't want to throw my weight around. I have a lot of connections in Hollywood, you know. That's so? In the trade 30 years. I was one of the first. You can make a lot of friends in 30 years. How about the books and pictures we found in your car? How do you explain it? Come on over here. I'll show you boys something you never saw in your life before. You got a show you this, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, what's that? This studio will be back on its feet in a year. I'll bet a thousand dollars on it. This whole block here, sound stages. 
I got plans for him in my desk. That's so. You have an interest in this lot, do you? Not exactly. Not right now, anyway. I did have an interest, though. I will again. I was one of the original owners, you know. Is that right? Me and five other men. We were the top people in Hollywood when we opened West Side. I was a young fellow at the time. We made pictures, mister. Great pictures. Not like today. It's changed. It's all gone now. What have you been doing lately, Hopkins? I mean, what do you do for a living? Different things. I have a few investments, private income. I made money with West Side. That's when the town was really turning out pictures. I made big money. What are you doing today? I told you. Different things. We have a lot of them out here. They like to nest in those eucalyptus trees over there. Nice sound, isn't it? Now, look, we still haven't got an explanation. How about the books and pictures that we found in your car? Oh, that? Hm. Nothing to explain, is there? Just a few gimmicks I picked up. You know a boy by the name of Steve Banner? Banner? No, I don't think so, huh? How about Bud Spencer? You know him? No, I knew a George Spencer once. Actor. Now, that was back in the old days, though. So. How about Laura Osborne, Dorothy Ryan? Do you know them? No, it's pretty hard to say, you know, Sergeant. Over the years, in this business especially, you meet an awful lot of people. Yeah, well, these are fairly recent. You ought to remember them. They're just kids, 17-year-olds. No, I'm afraid I can't recall the names. You know, we might go into television here. I don't know. Television films. The trouble is, they make them too fast. Trade's not like it used to be. Quality, that's what we went after. It's all gone now. It's all gone. West Side will do it again, though. You can bet on that. We're coming back. How about leveling, Hopkins? You know why we picked you up. You know why we're out here. That's just it. I don't know. This way. How about it, officer? You remember this one? Don't believe I do. Well, no offense. You were in neat pants when I shot my westerns here. Great stories. One of them was the greatest of all. Is that right? Greatest of them all, Thunder on the Trail. That's what we called it. We shot the big scene for it right on this street. That was almost 30 years ago. <laughs> Doesn't seem that long, just like yesterday. Yeah. Conway Blackburn was my director for that one. Big Clyde Harrison was the star. I always called him Big Clyde. Didn't look too strong, but he had arms like steel. You know, that man could lift an engine right out of an automobile with his two hands. Powerful. Is that so? And how he could handle a horse. Ride like the wind, old Clyde. Never looked better in his life than he did that day. I was there. I know. Is that right? Thunder on the trail. Shot the final big scene right on this street. Great thrill, officers. One of those things that happens once in a lifetime. Never forget it. Now, this here was the town. See what I mean? Frontier settlement. Rough as they come. It's where the Kelsey gang was hanging out. Real bunch of killers. Just in the picture, I mean. Uh-huh. And single-handed, Big Clyde came into town to take on the leader. That was Tim Kelsey. He'd killed Clyde's brother, and Clyde was out for revenge. He should have been here to see us. It was Saturday night. The town was wide open, going full blast. Over in the Palace Hotel, they were betting ten to one that Clyde would never make it. And right across the street, there in the Silver Dollar, Kelsey's gang was setting up drinks on the house. They felt that sure of themselves. The town was swarming with people. And I was standing right there with Connie, the director, right behind the camera. Right next to us, we had the orchestra. You know, three pieces. We had to have the orchestra to get the actors in the mood. I see. Yes, sir. There it was, all ready to go. A thousand extras. It was all set. The big scene. Connie gave the sign to the orchestra. That's it, boys. Keep it bright. Connie looked around just to check once more to see that everything was all right. And he picked up the megaphone. All ready, everybody. Places, everybody. All right. Camera! Action! All right, Clyde! There he came, riding into town. Big Clyde. Way up from the end of the street. Came right straight through the town. Past the telegraph office, past the general store, riding straight toward the silver dollar. Yeah. A little slower, Clyde. A little slower. That's it. Now head straight for us. Right up to the hitching post there. Good boy, Clyde. Now he dismounts. That was his horse, Golden Fury. Now he turns, looks around him, and he starts straight for the swinging doors. Look grim, Clyde. That's it. 
A little more. Set your jaw. Good. Now, right through the doors. Hit him hard. There he goes. The whole Kelsey gang in there ready to kill him. There's no reaction for a few seconds. And all of a sudden, it gets quiet. Dead quiet. Tim Kelsey looks up from the bar. He sees Clyde. All right, now. Throw that lamp. Smash it! Then the pipe starts. And then this fight. No holds barred. One end of the room to the other. Finally, they crash the swing doors to a Tim Kelsey Clyde. Wrestling, slugging, kicking, punching each other. Kelsey goes down. Then Clyde. Then Kelsey. Clyde goes down. Then Kelsey. One of the gang standing by over the Palace Hotel. He draws his gun. Look out, Clyde! Fires twice. Three times. Bites him in the shoulder. Kelsey takes aim to finish him off. Clyde whips out his gun from his holster and fires twice. Once more. Kelsey stops short. Dead. The other man staggers a little bit, doubles up, crumples, falls down the stairs into the dirt. Clyde starts to get up. One of the gang in the saloon takes a beat on him. Clyde whirls and fires. Good boy, Clyde. Good. Now, slowly, over to your horse. Slowly. That's it. Put your arm around his neck. <laughs> he nuzzles you a little. Now back in the saddle. Slow. Deliberate. You're wounded. It hurts, Clyde. Now you turn. Look off down the street. You start to soften. You see the school marm, Gladys, your sweetheart. That's it. Warmer. Good. Now you go to her, boy. Go to her. Now, pick her up and put her on Golden Fury with you. That's it. There he goes. Beautiful. Beautiful. The two of them riding toward the hills, riding off together. Cut it! Print it! That's just the way it was. Yes, sir. I stood here and saw it. They don't make pictures like that anymore. Yeah. How about it, Hopkins? You want to tell us now? What is there to tell? You've been working the school trade, haven't you? Books, pictures, hiring kids like Steve Banner, Bud Spencer. Yeah. I'm ashamed. Who wouldn't be? I had to eat. It was the only way. I had to live. Yeah, well, there's still honest jobs to be had. No way of telling how many youngsters you hurt by spreading that junk around. No way of adding up the trouble you caused. Yes, I know I was wrong. I'm sorry for that. How about this man named Jack? What was his part? He was in with me. He used to be my cameraman back in the old days. Same thing. You can't blame him either. He had to live, too. Where do you keep the stuff? I'll show you. All right. You ready to go? Yes. Kind of a long walk. Would you like to read the trade papers on the way? Yesterday's. January 29th, trial was held in Division 87, Municipal Court, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of violation of Section 311 of the California Penal Code, manufacturing and distributing obscene literature. 
His accomplice, Jack Lavery, was apprehended and tried and convicted of the same charges. Violation of Section 311 PC is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for a period not to exceed six months or by a fine of $500 or both.